Warning, strong content. This episode of Murder Trails includes references to true crime, murder and homicide and to people who are now deceased. For more information, please read our description. Welcome to Murder Trails, presented by Jack Sim and Crime Tours Australia. Hello and welcome to Murder Trails, Season 1, Episode 1, the build-up to the Whiskey A Go-Go. I'm Jack Sim, Director of Crime Tours Australia and publisher and author of the Murder Trails book series. And joining me here in my skull cave <laughs> is, this is uh, pretty spooky, I tell you. <laughs> is my friend and colleague, Councillor Paul Tully, a longtime true crime uh, uh, historian and fan, and interested in, like me, in the kind of dark side of uh, the Sunshine State. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, but, thanks. Uh, it's great to join you, Jack. Well, today we're going to be talking about the Whiskey A Go Go. And, 50 years ago this year, 2023, on the 8th of March, 1973, uh, what was at that time Australia's greatest act of mass murder, at least in the 20th century, uh, took place here in Brisbane, in Brisbane's very well-known Fortitude Valley. Um, it was a terrible thing. Uh, it was only eclipsed by the, the hor horrific uh, uh, crime committed by Martin Bryan at Port Arthur in the 1990s, but at the at, in the early 70s, I mean, this was a hell of a thing. Paul, you're a bit older than me. You, you remember what how it affected Brisbane? You know, can you share with us what it was like? Absolutely. It was a, a Thursday morning. Um, yeah, I still recall it well. I had just been in the uh, Commonwealth Public Service for about a month at that stage, and uh, people woke up shocked. Um, all radio stations were, were running with the uh, story. It was a bit after two o'clock in the morning, but for 15 people to, to die in such horrific circumstances um, was extraordinary. It, you know, it, Brisbane was still getting it out of that country town sort of thing that's been talked about for a long time. You know, after World War War II, the trams had uh, just stopped running in 1969. It was a, a pretty laid back sort of uh, you know, city. And uh, for that to, to happen in, in Brisbane just shocked people. You know, in Queensland and around Australia, it, it was a terrible crime and something I guess people thought would never come to sunny Queensland. At that time, the newspapers were full of stories about the IRA bombings in London, the Irish Republican Army trying to drive the British out. You know, it, 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 that was the sort of thing that seemed like a world away. Uh, li literally was a world away, and no one thought that you know, that sort of crime would, would come to Queensland, but, but it did. And, uh, of course, there'd been the lead-up to it um, with yeah. a lot of publicity, and there was, a, uh, I guess, an expectation, but people might have put it down to journalistic speculation, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't purely speculative, it actually happened and um, yeah, there'd been some earlier um, similar offences, not where people had died, but um, it, it was terrible. 15 people ranging in age from 17, I think, through to 50. Um, 15 people from 17 through to 50. That was terrible. And uh, yeah, I was looking recently at the, um, uh, where they came from. There were uh, 12 of them from Brisbane two from Rockhampton and uh, one from Ipswich. So uh, a whole range of ages, but it, it was a crime that stunned the capital of uh, Queensland. It, I, I think what one of the, uh, in total of 15 fatalities, there were 10 men and five women. And I think like, I, I was born in Brisbane, I grew up in the 70s and this, the, this, this crime haunted our city. Like it, it just, with, the, the, those that were arrested in relation to it, which we're going to talk about, mm. um, arguing from within jail that they were innocent of the, being involved, uh, the, the ongoing problems with police corruption and the wider community being aware of uh, criminal elements operating seemingly with impunity through the 70s and 80s. This crime didn't just kill those people, it continued to trouble our society for decades after, and still to this day, 50 years down the track, we still don't really know exactly what the hell happened on that fateful night in March 1973. But one thing I do know, Paul, is that quite often when people are reminded about this case on our crime tours or through my books, is people are often unaware, as you were saying, 
that there was a build-up to the Whiskey of Go-Go. This didn't just suddenly happen. There'd been a foreshadowing of it through a series of violent acts um, that, that were in the build-up to the actual uh, actual case. And that's what I thought we might talk about on today's episode, was yeah, to look absolutely. at that. Um, the, now, the Brisbane nightclub scene was becoming increasingly violent around this time. Uh, to explain uh, what... You sort of—I know you probably didn't go out to nightclubs a lot. But, oh yeah, but it was, was it was it what, what was it like the nightclub well, scene in the early seventies in Brisbane? Yeah, it was sort of interesting. That that was a major attractor for yeah you know, for people the yeah, different nightclubs and um, yeah you know, Torino's in the valley and Checkers in Elizabeth Street in the heart of the city. I didn't spend a lot of time. I even remember one that doesn't feature in this thing, Willie's Bazaar oh, up right, near the really? uh, yeah Willie's Bazaar. And Willie, yeah, uh, you know, she had hair out to hear something like that yeah but it was where people went it wasn't there was a lot nation, the national hotel i think it was running at this the, time the national state, hotel was still there and, um i think cloudland still existed you know where people wanted you know more regular regular um, disco and dancing um but it was the sort of place that uh, places that attracted people to to go there and uh these different nightclubs a lot of them were financially yeah quite successful, but not all of them. Not all of them, that's right. Well, at, at that time, Brisbane had 12 licensed cabaret clubs. Like, that's extraordinary. I don't know if Brisbane's got 12 of them now. Like, well, I suppose it, you and I are <laughs> checking at the moment. But it really was the, the night scene because there wasn't a lot lot to do. Yeah, yeah you know, even pubs in those days, the you know, just ordinary suburban hotels weren't into you know, having a lot of music and entertainment there. So lots of people, whether they're from Ipswich, Redlands, you know, and surrounding areas, they'd head into the Brisbane CBD and Fortitude Valley to, to, to go to these nightclubs. Yeah. I was I was quite surprised as I've been doing research um, through the state library of old newspapers and archives. And I've got to thank my researcher Annie, who is very very good at her role. She, a young lady who spends time trolling through newspapers for a boss, you know, uh, who I send her on some quite wild uh, adventures reading papers, newspapers, something that she's never really even, right. you know experienced yeah. before. Yeah. Um, but help, any helping us with preparation for today's episode, she found some great information. I mean, one of the articles I found was talking about the the licensing arrangements for these cabaret clubs, which is really quite fascinating. In those days, the licensing branch of the police looked after the licensing, as I understand it. And night, uh, not, uh, cabaret clubs, nightclubs, had were not allowed to open before 7 p.m., and, but they and they had to see serving alcohol by 3 a.m. They could still be serving a drink at 3 a.m. and patrons could keep drinking till 3:15. Yeah. I think it was a.m. Yeah. Um, it's just interesting. Like there was a time period in the 1990s and 2000s where clubs and hotels in Brisbane were, were, had, had, didn't have anything like that degree of liberal well, liberalness. Yeah, and that, that were in the days when uh, the uh, drinking age was still 21. That didn't change until uh, 1974. Um, can I say, and I don't want to um, dob myself in, I know the statute of limitations <laughs> would probably protect me, but um, <laughs> there were plenty of people who were, um, and, and young girls as young as 15, would, would in some cases look 21, 22, but the licensing branch was around. They were in hotels, they were coming to the cabaret, the nightclubs, uh, for underage drinkers, um, but that was pretty, pretty, pretty normal for for people underage to be drinking in those days. And then, of course, it all changed in 1974 um, when the um, Age of Majority Act, um, yeah, reduced the age down to 18. Yeah, it was a very colourful scene. The cabarets of this era, some of them, um, uh, like Checkers that you mentioned in Elizabeth Street, um, you know, they boasted international acts. They had yeah. they had singers coming from the states. Um, they put on uh, what were what were uh, called in those days transvestites, so mm. men, men pretending to be women, um, and that you know, that was quite you know quite risque in that in, the, in those days. Oh well, um, the, the premier at the time, you know, J. B. Elder Peterson, he wouldn't have a bar of it. You know, there was I still remember. I think it was about seventy two when he. Uh, banned condoms from universities, you know, condom vending machines in universities. You only had to go back a few years. That's that's not possible. But yeah, that, that was the era, a very conservative era in some ways that we were living in in Queensland. It was, yeah, it was, it, I find it quite remarkable. And so Danny in her research, you see this sort of like this very conservative feeling for society, but these nightclubs, these cabaret clubs and such, this is where people could just sort of 
have a little bit of liberalness and have a bit of fun and let everything. the hair down. Yeah, let absolutely. Down, yeah, you know, yeah, and that was the scene in Queensland. Yeah, yeah you know, people would yeah you know, pick a club to go to. They'd go there you know, frequently and go to different ones as well. But um, yeah, that was the nightclub scene. That was the entertainment scene in in Queensland in the yeah you know, the sixties and seventies. And these were very popular venues. But then all of a sudden, in around nineteen seventy three, the start of that year, things turned quite dramatically. Uh, there's a dramatic turn in terms of the perception of these places, and the first act that really the one of the one of the incidents that sort of sets off a series chain of uh, violent uh, episodes that lead up to the Whiskey Go Go was on the 11th of January 1973. The acting manager of the Whiskey Go Go nightclub um, in Fortitude Valley, uh, his his um, vehicle was set alight. Um, the, uh, the the nightclub club the whiskey a go go was uh, was really quite popular with with um, with a wide range of age groups and ages. Um, we'll get bit, I'll talk a bit more about that when we start to address the actual fire at the club. But I've got an article here, Paul, from the Brisbane Telegraph um, from um, the twelfth of January nineteen seventy three, and it says uh, car set on fire near nightclub. A firebomb placed in a in an old model sedan outside the Whiskey Go Go nightclub in the valley last night caused about three hundred dollars damage to the vehicle. That's about two grand in mm. today's money. The car is owned by the acting manager of the nightclub, Mr. William John McLarry of Clayfield. McLarry said today they left the car in a lane outside the club in St Paul's Terrace about eight p.m. At nine thirty, he was called when it was on fire. I never locked my car. Apparently, the person who put the firebomb inside must have been an amateur because all the windows were still up which stopped the fire from spreading he said mr mclary said it had taken he'd only taken over as manager three weeks ago city life is just too much for me i think uh, once i get things settled with police overnight over last night's incident i'll head back to dolby where my parents own a hotel he said warning said the sub line uh, sub uh, title mr mclary said he would not go back to the whiskey a go go tonight because he thought last night's incident might have been a warning to him. I have no enemies in Brisbane, but it's a big city and I suppose at some time I may have upset someone at the club. It's in the hands of police. Mr. McClary said he'd not previously been threatened at the club, but he said, I'll be getting away from Brisbane as quick as possible, he said. The uh, article ends with Valley detectives are investigating. Yeah, and I think that was the sort of lead up to um, setting the scene that um, people were muscling in um, on the scene, creating fear um, in the minds of their nightclub owners and operators. And just one thing slowly led to another and it was reported by uh, the newspapers of the day, certainly the Telegraph, which was the afternoon newspaper in uh, Brisbane and the uh, Sunday Sun. It's sort of interesting how um, at that stage it was just a car uh, there were no deaths at that stage but you know looking back and it's easier now with the hindsight to see how bit by bit that fear was being installed in the minds of those operators it's it's it it, it was a uh, it sort of suddenly seemed to begin this sort of series of kind of news articles and public awareness that something wasn't right Discover Brisbane's criminal history. Join me, Jack Sim, and my team of guides as we explore Queensland's fascinating criminal past. Cases we explore include the Whiskey A Go Go, the Betty Shanks murder, and the Vampire Killer. We have a range of different crime walks and coach tours. To book a tour, brisbanecrimetours.com.au or crimetoursaustralia.com.au. Look forward to sharing dark house with you. On the 14th of January, just a few days after the, the, that firebombing of the club, um, one of the great journalists of Queensland past, um, Ryan Bolton, known as the Eagle, I think was his name. The Eagle name. was his name, yep. He, amazing man, often, um, he, well, he wrote for the Sunday Sun, I think it started with the Truth newspaper. It was the Sunday Truth up until the, the early um, 70s. And um, yeah, I met him, first met him in um, 1972 when he was a um, crime writer for the uh, Sunday Sun. Um, had a lot of contacts uh, with the police 
and, and, and with criminals and too. with criminals too yeah but they were in the days where journalists would meet uh, criminals and uh, detectives not together but in mainly in hotels around the city and they, they were able to get good stories from their contacts on both sides of the fence. Yeah, they, they worked their contacts well, they didn't breach confidences and such, but where necessary, you know, they, um, you know, they aired it through the papers. It's hard, those uh, listening and viewing might not realise, but today in a world where we've got the internet, we've got podcasts, you've got multiple channels uh, where you can learn and get information, not just uh, what was the case in 19, well, 1973, what, what, was, what were your standard formats to find that information? Well, you, did, you didn't have mobile phones, you didn't have uh, pages. Um, no uh, email, no computers? No, no emails, no computers. Um, I guess it was just a bit of word of mouth, a bit of radio, television, but it was very limited. Um, Newspapers were really probably the main way that people Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, complicated yeah. material, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and in the same way as we read on the net today, Newspapers were kind of where everyone got their info. Yeah, they? and then people talked. People talked at work. There was a lot more talking done than people walking around with something in their hand. Um, you had to get their Just information. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that actually led to, uh, there was a lot of rumour, there was a lot of innuendo, but I can say over the years, uh, a lot of rumour and innuendo is based on fact. Sometimes the, the, the all the details and facts um, you know, might vary from the final story, but gee, in that period of time, in the, in the lead up to the Whiskey A Go Go firebombing, um, there was a lot of speculation which proved pretty right in the end. Yes, it was a very, uh, it was sort of a, a slow burn, not wanting to be horrible, but it just sort of, it was a series of these incidents. Well, Brian's story on the front page of the, of the Sunday Sun was death threat to club bosses. Armed guards have been mounted on a 24 hour watch on two Brisbane nightclubs and the home of a club manager. I mean, you can't get much more pretty blunt. Than that. That's yeah, pretty like, blunt, isn't it? A second manager resigned and left town yesterday after his car was burned out by a firebomb. So this is just a couple of days later. And death threats are flying thick and fast. The two clubs are the Whiskey A Go Go in Fortitude Valley and Checkers in Elizabeth Street. Um, plushest nightclub in Queensland. It had opened a year earlier as with great fanfare in Elizabeth Street in a very old building, and I think I think the club was upstairs. Was yeah, it and it was uh, near the back of the where the Meyer Centre is now, be, between George Street and Albert Street. Albert Street. Yeah, 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 yeah up the top tucked end, in, uh, tucked yeah. in, the higher end of, yeah. uh, of Elizabeth yeah. Street. Yeah. That, that was a big, big precinct there at night. People would queue up to uh, to get in. As I was saying, you know, earlier the uh, nightclub scene was um, you know, huge, you know, and that's people. That, that's where, where people went. Just a, a, a bit of background. I mean, at this time, however, both Checkers and the Whiskey Go Go had been placed in the hands of, of administrators. They were struggling. Huge amount of money had been yep. poured yep. into Checkers and its layout, furnishings, fixtures, most of the best you know acts in Queensland arriving from overseas. But you know, within a short space of time, both clubs were in trouble. Um, fraud squad detectives said Brian are investigating the alleged disappearance of fifty thousand dollars from the clubs. When you run that through the inflation calculator, that comes in at close to half a million dollars today. Big, big money, and there was big money in those clubs. But you know, if there was any fraud involved, of course, it made them um, non-viable, and that, that's proved to be the case. And that's where I think, um, yeah, you know, the perpetrators. Uh, whoever they may have been, and there's still some speculation about that in relation to the whiskey uh, a go go, um, they, they knew that they could pressure the nightclub operators. This, um, we're, we're talking of the finances, Brian went on in his article to lay it even clearer. He wrote that uh, the brothers who own the clubs, Brian and Ken Little, who are now long passed away, told Sunday Sun that they had been threatened with death a number of times. Once a man held a loaded gun two inches from our heads while he made the threat, Ken Little said. It's a terrible business. I don't know where it will end. I was told recently that there were heavies in town who would take care of me, said Ryan Little. I mean, this is the bad side of the Sunshine State. You know, there's lovely nightclubs bringing people pleasure and everything. Yet behind the scenes is all of this going on. And it seemed to be the Sydney connection, partly in relation to that. You know, those who'd come from Sydney saw the opportunity to muscle in um, on this industry and it um, uh, appears that they carried their threats out eventually. It's shocking to think that something like this can happen to people, but because they are in business and just trying, because they're in business and just trying to provide entertainment. 
this was you know this was um, the scene you know which would ultimately lead to what happened what would happen to whiskey so armed um, security guards were placed at both clubs and they were guarding the home of the manager of checkers as well um, there was meetings to be held between creditors and so on so it's such a a dubious kind of situation you know it's an extraordinary uh, it's not quite as simple as just some madman going to throw uh, drums of fuel into a club uh, on the 17th of january 1973 uh, the alice's cafe in brunswick street is set alight paul it's around two uh, around three o'clock in the morning um, um the, the, the 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 cafe catches a light spreads upstairs into like a a little coffee coffee house upstairs, burns the pet food store next door, mm. the whole building's a write-off, um, $20,000, $250,000 in today's money of damage caused. The man that owns Alice's is uh, uh, John Hanna. Whose name is pretty well known in Fortitude Valley yeah. Colourful actions I over the years. Colourful identity. Absolutely. One of his last roles, John Hanna, was is he was the manager of the very well-known Beat Nightclub yeah. in uh, in uh, uh, Ann Street in the city, and uh, which I'll explain in a moment, has a connection itself to uh, these these violent incidents of the day. John Hannay was interviewed by a reporter outside his burnt out cafe. He was asked, Do you have any idea you know, how this fire's happened? He said, oh, I think a toaster caught a light. <laughs> Sometimes they tried to play that down because I, I think that shows that they knew there was something serious uh, just bubbling away and about to happen, and they didn't want to. Um, you know, have a shotgun to their head either. Some of some of the research I've done talking with criminal acquaintances of mine or former criminal associates of, of these people of the era, uh, one of them had said to me that uh, John Hannay took off soon after this, like uh, if it was just a toaster, he said like, that's, that's, no, no, he goes, John pissed off, to use his word, John pissed off and left town The bloody big toaster. But yeah. <laughs> yeah and that, that was the cause. Well, according, according to what I've learned, it might be, you know, of course, I'm dealing with hearsay. This isn't stuff that's written down no, in documents. No. But John moved to North Queensland and ran a number of pubs, hotels, entertainment venues up in Mackay and other places in regional Queensland for decades yep. before he came back to town. Something shook him up for sure enjoy reading about true crime the murder trail series explores some of queensland's most infamous cases including who killed betty shanks slim halliday the taxi driver killer the rampage of killer cast and innocence lost the last man hanged in queensland just some of the titles available at jacksim.com.au i'm jack sim please support my local publishing business as i explore some of queensland's dark past um, and then uh, just three weeks before uh, just three weeks before the whiskey burned a barman at the club his brother uh, on the day of the fire bombing revealed that his brother had been menaced by a gunman um, who pulled a gun on him at, inside the whiskey go, 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 pulled a pistol on him and threatened his life um, unfortunately that barman was to die one of the victims in the fire mm -hmm. as well then on the 25th of February 1973, completely forgotten largely now, Paul, was the firebombing of Torino nightclub yeah. in Ann Street. And just 11 days before the Whiskey to Go-Go. Did you ever go there? Or? Yeah, I, I think I've been once or twice. That was just down from Brunswick Street in, the, in Ann Street. Um, and that was a vacant club at that stage. It wasn't operating as a, as a full nightclub when that bombing occurred, but that was the the last sequence of events, I think, before the Whiskey A Go Go uh, firebombing. That was another place that even now, even today, if you, um, if I'm in in Brisbane or and coming through in the evening, um, there's a lot of activity still there. And um, but but that was that was terrible. Although there were no deaths, and I've got to say this, even though the Sunday Sun was pursuing all of these stories with a high degree of vigour, um, because there were no deaths, so just a fire, another fire, another threat. I don't think it really engaged the community all that strongly, but it was heading that way. It very was heading quickly. to something major. Yeah. I, I, with Torino's, it was it was on, it was a Sunday night when the, when it was firebombed. It was almost certainly the case that um, the perpetrators who blew up that club entered the club through they broke into the club and they set a drum of fuel a light uh, and then it exploded a young couple were walking up the street at about nine 
9.25 p.m. and they saw flames coming out of the, out the front mm. of the building. But uh, Les Barbour was the criminal investigation yeah. uh, scientific officer, branch, yeah, scientific yeah. branch yeah. of the police force. He was nicknamed, um, my friend Ken Blanche said that among reporters, he was nicknamed Sir Bernard Spilsbury after the British, uh, oh. the British, uh, uh, very famous British police scientist. Uh, but it was facetiously. Yeah, apparently. of course. And Ken Blanche, of course, was the chief of staff of the uh, Sunday Sun. And um, yeah, he oversaw what Brian Bolton was, was writing. And, you know, and I knew those um, people. And, um, you, you know, to go back 50 years, hard to believe that it's, you know, 50 years That's ago. That's long ago. And yet, you know, the impacts of all this still lie on us today. Um, the police determined, at first they thought maybe it was a gas explosion, but it was determined that it was a petrol drum that had been yes, set alight. Yes. And so it was virtually reminiscent of what was about to happen um, just, you know, 10, just over 10 days later. The uh, police at the time um, were quite eager to hose all of this down. Ryan Bolton wrote another article where he talked about how um, how things were were, uh, were were progressing. And again, in the Sunday Sun, he wrote another article in March the 4th, just um, just three uh, four days before the Whiskey A Go Go fire bombing. And Brian's article is, um, is headlined, Bomb Blast Heralds the Big Squeeze. Front page story. You know, this is significant stuff. Mm. Clubs told uh, clubs will be told to pay up or else. The bombing of a Valley nightclub last Sunday, Torino's, um, was just the first shot in a massive extortion racket by Sydney criminals demanding protection money from clubs between Brisbane and the border. One Sydney crime lord and another ranking crime boss are plotting to milk at least $10,000 a week, that's about $120,000 today, um, from the from dozens of clubs and classy restaurants, uh, and, and class restaurants. Sunday Sun investigators in Brisbane on the Gold Coast and in Sydney have been probing for six weeks the takeover of nightclubs in Queensland. Staff men talked to various veteran police, criminal lawyers and top underworld figures themselves. One notorious hoodlum told the crime reporter, publish that story and you'll wind up in concrete boots at the bottom of the river. That's the Brisbane River. Um, when Sunday Sun put the result of its investigation to the police commissioner, Mr. Whitrod, he said police are working on this line of inquiry. Yeah, Ray Whitrock, he was an honourable uh, police commissioner, certainly much more honourable than at least one of his um, successors. But um, I, I'd say it, this was rare for this form of criminality in Queensland. It was very difficult for the police to, to handle this, you know, the honest police officers, because this was so rare. I don't believe this sort of extortion in it to this level had ever occurred in Queensland before. And I don't think they even realised the uh, after Torino's was, was blown up, you know, what was going to happen about 10 days later. I, um, I, I found an article written around the same time as that headline that, that Brian put in the Sunday Sun Paul. And a, a detective, the police were at great pains to discount all of this stuff about that the, there were Southern elements standing over clubs. One detective who remained unnamed, these were his words, Frankly, I can't see anything in our nightclubs that would make a Southern criminal want to take them over. Yeah, that that was the the disdain that was shown to people who were speaking the truth. Brian, a couple of people in that era who really stand out. Brian Bolton, his nickname, as you said, was the uh, the Eagle, and I think Billy Stokes, who um, served time for more, he was a tattooist. He put a huge eagle on what one of um, Brian Brian's uh, arms. Uh, Brian told me, he said, oh, I was so drunk. By the time I wake up next morning, I had this huge tattoo on my, my arm. And very interesting. Um, well, Billy, in that of course, time. well, he went on to be charged with the murder of um, of, uh, of Hamilton, um, a, 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 a Stor- welterweight, welterweight boxer, boxer yeah. who, who, was, who was implicated by one of the men who was named as, or convicted of being involved in the whiskey game. Well, it was a real web of criminality. But the other person who, who was a uh, state member for um, Archerfield, uh, Kev Hooper, he, he was on about police corruption for a long time. And that was poo-pooed. The mainstream media um, said that's not true. Um, but Kevin persisted. He, he had a lot of causes in the time from 72 to 1984. I believe he was the, uh, the, the state member. And he, he was 
um, in opposition, uh, but every time he raised these issues, he was put down by the government of the day and the police who, who denied that there was um, any wrongdoing um, in the police force So um, in those days. But yes, it was um, easy for the police of the day to say that it's not true, it's not happening, but it was just about to explode in the fiercest way possible. Discover Brisbane's criminal history. Join me, Jack Sim, and my team of guides as we explore Queensland's fascinating criminal past. Cases we explore include the Whiskey A Go Go, the Betty Shanks murder, and the Vampire Killer. We have a range of different crime walks and coach tours. To book a tour, brisbanecrimetours.com.au or crimetoursaustralia.com.au. Look forward to sharing dark past with you.